podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. This is Julia Talbot at the Department of Family and Support Services, and it is with my greatest pleasure I welcome you to the webinar for the Congregate Di Dining Meal Services RFP that by our senior uh, division here. Um, we're going to do the volume of participants and just standard DFSS practice. Everybody has been placed on mute. Please submit your questions via the question box and we will respond to questions after going through the slides and use the question box to notify us of any technical issues you may be having with today's presentation. I will also add um, that this webinar will be posted uh, on our YouTube channel and a link to that will be made available on the DFSS website underneath the information, the other information about this RFP. Uh, you can access those through the alerts section or the funding opportunities section. And generally speaking, when we get those links, we post them at the bottom kind of of the page about the RFP, the, with, that has the information about the RFP. I will mention this a few times during this presentation, but it's always a question of how do we get to hear this Yes, you are being recorded, and how do we get to hear this if we miss it or we want to somehow pass it on? Today, I will be joined by um, Madeline Petrilla, who is our project coordinator, Christine Velez, and Nikki uh, Garbus Prustos, the commissioner who is who is the assistant commissioner in senior services, but also of the universe. Uh, in case you, you were wondering, you should go to her for all of your questions. Just about everything, not even just not not even congregate dining, but but everything. So here we are at the agenda, and I'm going to turn this this uh, the rest of this uh, presentation up to the timeline and technical assistance for applications over to Ms. Madeline, uh, where she can tell you all about the program opportunity we have here. After her presentation, we will break for questions. And then I'll go into how do we actually make the application in the e-procurement environment. And then we can have more questions if there are any. Um, once again, all of this information will be posted on the DFSS YouTube site and a link will be posted in the DFSS website. So welcome Madeline and all my senior, uh, senior staff or senior division coworkers. Um, let's get started. Thanks so much, Julia. Thank you, Julia, and thank you everyone for joining us today um, as we talk about the Congregate Dining Meal Services RFP. Um, here is our agenda for today. So we will go into our purpose now of the RFP. The Department of Family and Support Services is seeking proposals from qualified agencies for the provision of congregate dining meal services that are high quality, nutritious, responsive to consumer needs and preferences, and culturally appropriate and cost effective. The congregate dining program currently operates two models. Catered meals, which are meals prepared off-site and delivered to DFSS designated nutrition sites. So these would be um, our senior sites, um, satellite centers, uh, CHA buildings. Um, and we have 44 nutrition sites that are located within five geographic regions, Southeast, Southwest, Central West, Northeast, and Northwest. And you can see more about these sites in attachment one of the RFP packet. Um, we will be awarding contracts by region for catered meals. For on-sites, these are meals that are prepared and served at the same location. These are culturally specific diets. Um, and through the on-site program, we may be looking to see Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Latinx, Caribbean, Italian, Greek, Lebanese, kosher, halal, Indian, Pakistani meals. DFSS may award up to five nutrition sites that prepare and serve meals as on-site meal providers as funding allows. The awarded congregate meal providers 
will be responsible for the provision of meals and related nutrition supplies and equipment as specified in the RFP. The City of Chicago's Department of Family and Support Services is the city's primary social services provider for vulnerable residents of Chicago. DFSS's mission is working with community partners. We connect Chicago residents and families to resources that build stability, support their well being, and empower them to thrive. DF DFSS's priorities are to deliver and support high quality, innovative, and comprehensive services that empower clients to thrive to collaborate with community partners, sister agencies, and public officials on programs and policies that improve Chicagoans' lives and advance systemic change, and to inform the public of resources available to them through DFSS and its community partner partners, and steward DFSS resources responsibly and effectively. For more information, please visit www.cityofchicago backslash FSS. The DFSS Senior Services Senior Division is the Senior Services Area Agency on Aging or the AAA for the City of Chicago as designated by the Illinois Department on Aging. As the Area Agency on Aging, DFSS Senior Services provides various programs and services that protect the rights and support the needs of Chicago's older adult residents. One of these programs is the Congregate Dining Program, also known as Golden Diners, which assists older adults 60 years and older and their spouses of any age to live independently by promoting better health through improved nutrition and reducing isolation through program socialization and the provision of additional supportive services. In accordance with the goals of the Older Americans Act, the Congregate Dining Program works to reduce hunger and food insecurity, reduce social isolation of older individuals, promote the health and well being of older individuals, and delay adverse health conditions. Currently, um, before the COVID-19 pandemic, the Congregate Dining Program provided 800,000 meals to over 25,000 older adults annually. As of fiscal year 21, the Congregate Dining Program provided 500,000 meals, which were served to over 13,000 older adults annually. And the greater portion of these meals were served as to go rather than dine in. Our priorities um, for this RFP are to improve the provision of culturally appropriate, nutritious, and high quality meals to help promote the health and well being of older adults who are experiencing food security. DFSS encourages submission of several offerings, inclusive of and that may be infused with a variety of diverse meals Latinx, Southern, Caribbean, Italian, Greek, Indian, Halal, etc. The target population for this RFP in accordance with the Older Americans Act, service providers must target older adults with the greatest economic and social need who are low income minority older adults and those with limited English proficiency. Individuals eligible to receive meals at a congregate dining nutrition site include the following, but is not limited to individuals aged 60 years or older, and the spouses of those individuals regardless of age, including individuals of the same sex who are legally married. There are no income thresholds or costs to eligible recipients for the meal service. However, clients receiving meals are asked to make a voluntary contribution towards the cost of these meals. All congregate meal providers are required to comply with the requirements of the program as specified in attachment three and within this RFP. All meals must follow the meal pattern developed by the Illinois Department on Aging and all menus must be approved by a registered dietitian. In addition to complying with these standards, all meals must provide the following 
one serving of lean meat or meat alternative, two servings of vegetables, one serving of fruit, two servings of grains, bread, or bread alternatives, one serving of fat-free or low-fat or milk alternative, uh, decaf coffee, tea as requested, margarine when rolls are served. Um, these must be offered daily as part of the menu for all meal types. And each meal unit equates to one meal, and this consists of the following. The total cost of the specified food, delivery to the site, specifically for catered meals, disposable and non-disposable supplies, eating utensils, serving equipment, cleaning supplies such as garbage bags, dish detergent, and vinegar, transport packaging, and others, uh, other supplies as applicable. Serving equipment such as steam tables and coffee pots should be furnished by awarded caterers. Please see pages 13 to 14 of the RFP for more information regarding required food service equipment. Additionally, please consult the following attachments for applicable information on nutrition sites. The regional geographic boundaries can be found in attachment one, congregate dining program catered nutrition sites. Nutrition site listing is located in attachment two, which is the, the site location and serving information for catered sites, which includes respective sites, meal serving days and times, diets and cuisines served, daily number of meals served at each location. Additionally, the sample menus can be found in attachment four under menu samples. The meal types to be provided within this program are hot lunch, breakfast meal, box lunch. And these have the same rate um, that should be proposed for both. And that's applicable for catered and on sites. Hot or cold to go box meals, that's applicable for catered and on sites. Pre plated meals or box lunches, those are applicable for catered meals. Holiday meals, these are themed um, and these are applicable for catered and on sites. Special citywide box lunch meals, applicable for catered sites. Special event hot or box meals, these are specialty meals that are applicable for catered sites. Special event breakfast meals. These are specialty meals applicable for catered sites. Shelf stable meals. These are applicable for catered and on sites. Additional program requirements. Uh, cycle menus for both catered and on sites. These, there are four seasonal cycle menus for the hot lunch, pre-plated and breakfast meals. Draft menus are due to DFSS consulting dietitian no later than 45 days prior to the next menu cycle and must be approved by the registered dietitian. Menus must be prepared in accordance with DFSS menu planning standards found in attachment number five and DFSS food specifications for cycle menus found in attachment number six. The meal serving guide must be prepared by the congregate meal provider for catered sites and submitted to the DFSS consulting dietitian for approval when submitting cycle menus. In terms of meal orders for catered sites, these should be submitted by DFSS one week in advance. Changes to meal orders will follow the timeframe specified within the RFP. Days of operation, all sites typically serve meals a minimum of five days per week. All congregate nutrition sites are closed on six major holidays. Distribution of required program information, unless otherwise specified, information will be developed by DFSS and distributed via awarded meal providers. Nutrition education, this is applicable um, for on-site meal providers as they will be responsible for developing materials. The nutrition risk brochure, food allergies and special diet information sheet, SNAP information, and the annual client satisfaction survey. 
service delivery specifications for catered meal providers. More information can be found on page 17 and 18 of the RFP. Meal packaging must meet regulations approved by the Chicago's Department of Public Health and be designed to prevent seeping, spilling, dripping, and leaking. All meal delivery equipment must be food safe, appropriate, and capable of maintaining hot and or cold temperatures. Hot food must be delivered hot, no less than 135 degrees Fahrenheit, and cold foods must be delivered cold, no higher than 41 degrees Fahrenheit. In instances of reported shortages or poorly prepared meals, the meal proprietor will make every attempt to replace necessary items prior to serving time or issue a credit to DFSS. Service delivery specifications for on-site meal providers. More information can be found on page 18 through 20 of the RFP. Food service staff are required and there will be a flat partial reimbursement rate of $15 an hour. Adequate facility compliance is also required. Please see attachment number nine for the program self-evaluation checklist. Outreach, socialization, participant registration, and collection of volunteer contributions will also be uh, required. Next slide. Uh, quality control. For cook, chill, heat production systems or any production system that includes prepared food storage, a wardie will be required to submit food samples to laboratory for pathogenic organi organism analysis quarterly. The awardee must have clearly written sanitation, safety, and monitoring policies and procedures in place. Invoices, invoices and support documentation will be required to be submitted by the appropriate deadlines. For the catered meal provider, that will be weekly, and for on-site meal providers, that will be monthly. The good food purchasing policy, um, this is new. The congregate dining meal service providers will be required to participate in the good food purchasing program and will work with the GFPP team to record and report purchases and or pledge to participate in the good food purchasing goals. Please see the following attachments for more information. Attachment 7A is the good food purchasing program standards for food service institution. Attachment 7B is the GFPP tracking form. Attachment 7C is the good food purchasing pledge. DFSS seeks respondents with evidence of strong past performance against desired outcome goals. The performance indicators DFSS will be looking at are some, if not all of the following. 80% or more of the seniors indicate that they receive quality meals. 80% or more of the seniors indicate that their nutritional needs are being met by participating in the program. Completion of baseline assessment and active engagement in annual updates to its good food purchasing plan. Food service quality in terms of output metrics, the number of instances that food items and condiments provided are not specified on the menus. The number of food service issues, shortages or unauthorized substitutions are less than 5% of the number of deliveries made. 100% of food service issues involving more than three servings of an entree or side dish results in re-deliveries for catered meal providers. Timeliness of submission of quarterly menus and laboratory analysis from submitted food samples will also be tracked to ensure they are submitted by due dates. Responses to food service issues or concerns are addressed within 24 hours of receiving complaint. DFSS seeks respondents with evidence of strong past performance against desired outcome goals. For food safety, this would be the number of incidents of foodborne illnesses, 
the number of quarterly pathogenic organism analysis of food samples reporting positive for Shigella, Salmonella, and Listeria. A minimum average of 30 seniors per day will be maintained in the program for on-site meal providers. For GFPP implementation, the agency strives to meet at least the minimum baseline purchasing thresholds in each value category in the Good Food Purchasing Program over the life of the contract, with improvements demonstrated year over year through ongoing reporting and assessment. The selection criteria or basis of award each proposal will be evaluated on the strengths of the proposal and responsiveness to the selection criteria. Awards for congregate catered meal services will be made by region. Award for congregate on-site meal service will be based on score and funding availability. DFSS may consider additional factors in selection to ensure systems level needs are met such as geography or location across the city, capacity, experience, community needs, costs, and provision of culturally appropriate meals. Successful respondents must be ready to proceed with the proposed program by October 1st, 2022. Failure to submit a complete proposal with all required documentation may result in the proposal being deemed unresponsive and therefore subject to rejection. So for selection criteria, specifically organizational capacity, this section is worth 30 points and DFSS seeks respondents that demonstrate quality, qualified staff responsible for program oversight and management as indicated by its staffing pattern, job descriptions and resumes, and if relevant, a discussion of its subcontractors. Organizational expertise and capacity specific to the target population, adequate systems and processes to support monitoring program expenditures and fiscal controls, adequate human resources capacity to hire and manage staff, and a commitment to reflecting and engaging the diverse people in the community it serves. In terms of organizational capacity, this is additional items, um, and this section again is worth 30 points. DFSS seeks respondents to demonstrate that they have a plan to become more inclusive in their partnerships and operations, that they conduct regular training and continuing education and have a consistent method to onboard new staff, that they have a, a facility and equipment to support program operations both routinely and during a variety of emergencies, including but not limited to public health, weather, power failures, vehicular breakdowns, and employee absences. The number and type of meals it intends to serve daily and annually. In terms of the strength of proposed program, this section is worth 30 points. DFSS seeks respondents that demonstrate a clearly defined meal service program, including a description of its facility, the meal preparation model, quantity and quality of the equipment used, and storage. If relevant transportation and delivery protocols will also, relevant will also be described. An estimate of how many individuals will be served by this program, an outreach and retention plan that demonstrates an understanding of the target target population, their needs, and challenges. A mechanism for developing, disseminating, collecting, compiling, and analyzing client customer satisfaction surveys and ability to make programmatic adjustments as a result of this feedback. In terms of strength of proposed program, again, these are additional items, and again, this section is worth 30 points. DFSS seeks respondents that demonstrate 
their ability to support the city of Chicago's good food purchasing program goals by one, submitting the good food purchasing program implementation plan, and two, affirming compliance to meet the contract's data reporting compliance requirements. Appropriate expertise, knowledge, and experience in providing nutrition education, a plan for returning to in-person dining and socialization, specifically for on-sites only, or for meal redelivery or rerouting for catered sites. A nutritional analysis software program it intends to use or outlined another method of performing nutritional analysis. For performance management and outcome selection criteria, this section is worth 25 points. DFSS seeks respondents that demonstrate evidence of strong past performance against desired outcome goals and performance metrics and or other notable accomplishments in providing services to the target population. Experience using data to inform or improve its services or practices the relevant systems and processes needed to collect and store key participant and performance data, including client contributions as relevant. Having established effective quality control standards and procedures around food handling, processing, packaging, sorting, and delivery. The relevant systems and processes needed to track, manage, and report data used to determine performance on program outcomes. Selection criteria in regards to reasonable costs, budget justification, and leverage of funds. This section is worth 15 points. DFSS seeks respondents that demonstrate the fiscal capacity to implement the proposed program, reasonable implementation costs and funding requests relative to its financial and human resources, a cost proposal that supports the proposed scope of work or work plan, and that the respondent engages in a regular auditing process. Selection criteria, attachments specifically for catered meal applicants. For catered meal service applicants, please be sure to include the following. Congregate catered meal cost proposal found in attachment 8A. Resumes, certifications, and any special licenses for staff involved in the congregate dining program. A staffing chart that provides the number of line staff, supervisors, and other staff assigned to the project. A copy of the most current full public health inspection report for agencies currently providing meals to the public. Respondents applying to provide both catered and on-site meal services must complete separate applications for each service model. Selection criteria, attachments for on-site meal applicants. For on-site meal applicants, please be sure to complete and include the following. The congregate on-site cost proposal found in attachment 8B. The self-evaluation form found in attachment number nine, program accessibility self-evaluation. The resumes, certification, and any special licenses for staff involved in the congregate dining program. The staffing chart that provides the number of line staff, supervisors, and other staff assigned to the project. A copy of the most current full public health inspection report for agencies currently providing meals to the public. The contract term and respondent eligibility. The term of contract for this RFP. Funding is subject to the availability of funds from the City of Chicago, Illinois Department on Aging, and the Older Americans Act. The Delegate Agency Agreement awards will be made for a three-year period, October 1st, 2022 to September 30th, 2024, 
for an amount not to exceed $3,200,000 for the first budget year. DFSS reserves the option to extend the delegate agency agreements for one additional year. Eligible respondents for this RFP. Respondents for both catered and on-site meal services must be licensed and inspected food service establishments. Respondents for on-site meal services must have program facilities that are accessible to per persons with disabilities and in full compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. This is a com competitive process open to all entities, nonprofit, for-profit, faith-based, private and public, all units of government and sister agencies. The selection and transition timeline for this RFP. Today, we have the pre-proposal webinar, June 30th, 2022, from 10.30 a.m. to noon. The due date to submit pre-proposal questions is July 8th, 2022. Applications due are July 20th, 2022, by noon, for the program period starting on October 1st, 2022. Again, the deadline for applications for this RFP is July 20th, 2022 at 12 o'clock noon. Gosh, Madeline, uh, for all of that information, we're now gonna open the floor up for questions and then we will continue on with our presentation. I'm gonna go through a couple more, uh, some slides about how to make an application in the e-procurement environment, which is what the city of Chicago uses to manage and accept all applications for RFPs. And then we'll, we can open it up for questions after that as well. Um, I have three questions here that I see somebody put into the chat fairly early on. It was, do, are there letters of reference or support with this proposal that are required? Is there an estimated maximum amount of cost per meal? And can two or three staff work on R the RFP and iSupplier at the same time? Um, I can answer that last one, Mr. Peterson. No, you are not going to have be able to have two or three staff working on the RFP in the iSupplier environment at the same time. That is definitely, they will just kick each other out. You can't have actually more than one person. You can have more than one person have access to the iSupplier account or the iSupplier RFP but you're not gonna be able to be working simultaneously. It is not like anything nearly as sophisticated as sort of like one of a Google document or whatever. As, it, as um, I will explain in the slides coming up that I actually, I encourage people to work offline and save their answers in, um, you know, the, the, word, the word processing software of their choice, because after you apply, you are not actually gonna have access to your application except in a PDF form. So I really highly stress and suggest that people work offline in doing the application. Um, and then you have one person that just goes in and, and, and loads it all up. Um, but Madeline or Nikki or whomever, um, I know that there was somebody else who might be logged in here as well that can answer the first two questions. Um, are we looking for letters of support or reference? And then also, what is the estimated maximum cost Meal. Nikki, uh, is Nikki available to answer those questions? I believe who we had invited last. So it looks like Nikki is not currently going to be able to answer that question for us. So for the first question, there is no uh, letters of support needed. And then for the second question, there is no cap for the amount requested. Any other questions that anybody wants to ask at this time? Or Nikki, I see you're here. Is there anything you would like to add about the estimated 
cost of per meal in a maximum amount. Okay. So if there are no questions um, at this point, we're gonna just go continue on with um, my section about how to make an application in the e-procurement environment. It's um, a fascinating question. Oh, no, here we go. Can you explain the pre-proposal questions due on July 8th? That is just if you have additional questions, um, Ms. Minor, we do, uh, we publish all of the questions from this, from this webinar and any questions that we receive, into, we put those into an amendment, which is then attached to the application and needs to be accepted um, as part of the application process. And in fact, I'm one of the, some of the screens that I'm going to go for, uh, talk about, we'll talk about the, how to accept an amendment. And then, so that July 8th due date is to get into the amendment, we will, you know, please try to ask us those questions your questions before July 8th before we, so we can incorporate them into the amendment. Questions that we receive after July 8th, we will of course answer and we will just do another amendment, you know, to have follow-up questions, more questions that we, that we got. Um, but we would like to get them in the, you know, we like to get it in the system. Ah, here we go. Will only five agencies be awarded the grant for dine-in services? For on-sites, that will be up to five meal providers. Yes. What are the site addresses for the catered on-site meals? Are those available? Those are in um, attachments, uh, one of the first attachments of the RFP that list all of the catered meal sites. That's attachment one. Are there any other questions that are, that are coming in? Uh, Nikki says that she's having a hard time unmuting. Although I thought she she uh, had unmuted for a moment there. Wow, well, you know. Sometimes I guess now that I, I outed her as the uh, Assistant Commissioner of the Universe. The universe is conspiring to keep her silent. Um, so let's see if there are other any other questions, or if not, I'm just going to continue on talking about the amazing and illustrious iSupplier e procurement system, and then how to make an application in that system so that we can give you a contract for this great program. So iSupplier is uh, the city's platform. For, oh, are there also are the addresses for the on-site prep? So, what are the site the the, Kate, the addresses? This is a last a last minute question. Uh, the the site addresses for the catered on-site meals are included in attachment one. And then the question follow-up question was, what are the addresses for the on-site prep? Are those also so the the list of on-sites is not included because the uh, each on-site will be submitting their own application for their, um, because these are culturally relevant meals um, for their own site, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me. I, let's see if it makes sense for, to Ms. McNamara and all of our listeners. So, um, so uh, okay, let's see if there are any other questions. Uh, let's see. Nope. Okay. Anyway, you guys just don't want to hear about e procurement, which happens. Anyway, so we use the words I supplier and e procurement somewhat interchangeably. I supplier technically is the vendor platform. You have an account in iSupplier and that allows you to access e-procurement. Um, it says, oh, she says, no, 
Does that mean at your restaurant? So, um, Ms. McNamara, if you could, if you could maybe give more information about what you mean with that. So, if you're an applicant for the on-site, uh, for like your non-diet, for their your specific, where are the foods? Where will the food be served? I guess is the question. Uh, Okay, so I believe the food, Madeline, um, if you want to chime in or Nikki, where would the, the food will be served at one of our senior centers or? So if you are trying to apply to be an on-site meal provider at a restaurant, uh, like for the instance of example, a um, banquet hall or something, you would apply at that address where the meals would be served. So if you're a banquet hall and you're making the meals and you're serving them at the same place, then you would per, you would apply under that address where you're actually serving those meals. Does that make sense? We're now gonna, I'm gonna get back to I supply any procurement and then we will con continue this, I uh, guess. So yes, it is so not a city owned site, correct. So, um, so when you're making an application in the I the e procurement environment, you're gonna use your I supplier account to access I e procurement. You use e procurement to make, to make applications for different funding, you know, funding opportunities, be it RFP or IRQ, you also are going to use your e-procurement account to match or to manage your city contract. So that's where you're all going to upload any kind of documentation. You're going to do your vouchering. You're going to submit for payment. All of those kinds of activities all happen in the e-procurement environment. Um, and, and so it's important to have an account. You can't make an application without an account and you can't uh, in iSupplier and you are not gonna be able to submit an application to us any other way. If you have never done business with the city before, you're gonna need to, to register into iSupplier. That takes a, a few days. You fill out a few fields, you send it in, you, you know, to uh, the address submitted out address on the, the uh, website. And I have the website link in a couple of slides. And then you're gonna hear back from us to start your account. Pro tip, a lot of things that come from the e-procurement system end up in people's spam. So you really need to watch your spam or junk files or folders to see if something comes in from the system. Um, when you're looking to make your application, you're starting to think about your application, please review the, our RFP documents. So our RFP narratives, which are part of the, it's an attachment within the application field. Um, the scope of those, which Madeline just went through, rather lengthy and dense, that the, the scope is going to be um, directly tied to your application questions. And then they also align with the selection criteria. So when you are looking for guidance or answers, refer to that RFP document and use it for guidance in formulating your answers or the direction of your program. I always tell people to sit, carefully review the selection criteria because we build our evaluation tools out of that selection criteria. And those are aligned with the application questions very specifically and directly. Um, so use that as guidance. Um, there is a, when you go and make your application, there's a 4,000 character limit, which includes punctuation and spaces, and that's for each response. So when you go into the e-procurement environment, you'll see like a little box that's called quote value, which is e-procurement speak for an application question answer. And you have 4,000 characters, which is about two thirds of a single space, space page in which to give us your answer. A pro tip, do not use the back button on your browser when you're working in e-procurement because it will stop saving whatever you're doing and eventually you'll get an error message and get kicked out of the system. When you re-log in, you will find that none of the work you did after you hit that back button has had been saved. And so 
So don't use that. Navigate in the e-procurement environment by clicking on various things in the environment. Don't use that back, that back button. This is something that I have to say myself frequently. Um, I always, always say start early and save often as just part of your e-procurement experience. This is a system that does not crash much, and um, but it will time out if you just let it sit there. You know, it's pretty good at auto-saving, quite frankly. And in fact, I was going to say, like I said, it doesn't crash much. It actually doesn't crash at all. Sometimes it goes on lot down or offline because they're it's doing patches or whatever maintenance on it. But for the most part, it it does not. Um, this is not a system that crashes. If you are in the middle of a submission and you're up against the wire in terms of time, it will seem like it crashed, but it's really, that's just your application closing out and you're missing, missing the submission deadline. Um, a little word on that. I do su suggest to people that they really submit a day early. You can submit your application and you can later amend it up until the, the due date. And I tell people, Avoid the rush and possible mishaps by plan on your submission taking 30 to 60 minutes. I really tell people at this point, do it a day early, do yourself a favor, have it, this submission be a less stressful thing. Um, we don't accept late applications. The only way that the city can accept late applications is by reissuing the entire RFP and making people basically reapply who did make the application deadline. So we don't like to do that. And then finally, if you have questions, you should really make use of the e-procurement hotline at 312-744-4357 or 744-HELP. Please note though that the hotline operates during business hours only, which is Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. You can also call me or email me. I tend to work less strict hours. And if I get a hold of somebody, it's an easy question. I'm more than happy to try to give you an immediate answer. Sometimes the hotline does get backed up and you will leave a message and it will, it will take, take you know, up to a day or two business days to get back to you. I really try to re reach out to everybody within 24 hours. Um, most of the time, your questions are easily answered. Um, that being said, if you're really having a significant problem, the helpline or the hotline does have a higher level of access in this system than I do. And so I will end up referring you. Um, so those are the tips for working in a procurement. In terms of getting technical assistance on stuff, you can look for more funding opportunities on the DFSS webpage. For questions about registration or e-procurement technical assistance for delegate agencies, you're going to go, you can do the customer support if you prefer to email, or you can go to the helpline or hotline again. And then if you're the kind of person that really just wants to look at training materials, like you learn best through videos, through PowerPoint screenshots, that kind of stuff. There's a million training materials, or, or not millions, but you know, a, a robust amount of training materials that are documents and videos at this website. This is also where you would go to find out about how to start your e-procurement account, your iSupplier account, and um, and do all get all of those fun things. I also have a lot of screenshots and instructions on how to do you know, your basic kind of accessy stuff in e-procurement. It's not as we'll see in the upcoming screenshots where we, I walk you through how to do an amendment and how to submit. It's not always the most intuitive experience you're gonna have online, but it, it is what we have to work with and it manages a lot, some, you know, a lot of contracts and a lot of money for the city, so I'm not gonna, not gonna knock it. So that being said, we're gonna talk about how to accept an amendment. And then later I'm gonna talk to you about how to uh, submit your application when you're ready to submit. So as I said prior, how to accept an amendment, we do an amendment to amend our RFPs. Most of the time, 95 to 99% of the time, that is really just putting up the questions and answers that we receive at the webinar and prior to July 8th, or you know, if you get more questions post July 8th until the end of the, the, the posting the application period. We put up these amendments, um, we also, have used the amendment to include important information that was not, um, not that wasn't, you know, as an oversight, not included. Or we also can use amendments to give you more information if something has changed. So you, it's important to look at those amendment documents and see what they're about. It, you know, because it could be like, oh, we are extending the deadline. That is the kind of thing that we would do towards 
uh, via amendment. So in this particular screen, you're gonna see that the RFP you are interested in has been amended. So you're sort of trying to start your application. If you look here, you do your view amendment history, that's gonna take you to the uh, to part of, you know, to the acceptance page. If you were in, a, if this had not been amended, you were just gonna, and you wanted to start your application, you would just go to the action bar on the right-hand side and hold on menu to the create quote and then hit go. And so this amendment history, you're gonna click on that and it's gonna bring you to the, accept, the part of the acceptance um, the accepting process. Even if you try to create quote and hit go, I think it would throw you to this because you need to accept the amendment prior to starting the application. If you've already started an application, accepting the amendment, the process of accepting the amendment means that you will put all, it will, it will pull everything that you've done thus far in the application forward into the amended, uh, the amended document. So when you hit that, um, you know, when you hit this view amendment history, it's going to take you to this page. And this is where you can start to really see what is in the amendment and you can read about it. You can download the attachment that is the amendment, you know, that, that is the amendment and read it more thoroughly. Uh, you do that by clicking on this document number or on the review changes button. You can also see in this middle part, it says this addendum is to remind applicants. So it's basically, I do like a one pager that talks about, or not a one pager, but like a one sentence that sort of says the, the broad stroke of what this amendment is about. And then once you've reviewed everything and it's to your liking, or at least you have a comprehension about what it is about, you're gonna acknowledge the amendment by clicking on the upper or lower right-hand buttons that say acknowledge amendments. You're then gonna be talked, uh, thrown to this screen where you have to accept your acknowledgement. So you're gonna click this tiny box, which is accept the terms and conditions. And um, then you're gonna hit acknowledge on the right-hand side, which will then take you to this screen where you are confirming that you have acknowledged the acceptance of your amendment. And you'll hit yes. I don't, if you hit no, it just takes you back in some sort of hellish circle, um, but you'll hit yes. And that will take you to this final screen where you accept the terms and conditions of the amendment or of your acknowledgement of the amendment. So you're gonna hit accept on the right-hand side, upper or lower, you can see, and then you will have accepted the amendment and your life will be probably much the same as it was prior to accepting the amendment, but I'd like to think it perhaps a little bit better or maybe more well -informed. So that brings us to how to submit an application. So when you are done and you are ready to submit your application, you're going to start by saving your draft one last time uh, because, hey, you can't save a draft too many times. And then you're gonna hit continue. You actually don't have to save a draft last time, but I like to just sort of insert that, that, that little thing. I think everybody should save drafts all the time. Um, and then you're gonna hit continue. At this point, what it's, the e-procurement is gonna kind of take, do like a scan of your application and it's gonna highlight stuff that it thinks might be problematic or things that you might've forgotten. So it's kind of like a weird computer mom or whomever it is in your life that checks over your work and points out things, obvious errors. Um, so, I'm gonna go through the two most common errors that people get. This one is you must quote on at least one line in the RFQ. And so in this, in, that means in e procurement speak, that's talking about this little lines button that you can see right below the error. And I have a blow up of that just in case. The reason you're gonna get this error is because we always require a cost proposal or an, an, a, uh, a budget that is uploaded as a, a separate individual document in uh, as part of your application. But e-procurement really has, they have this lines function, which we use in the actual contracting process. The lines function, e-procurement e is gonna look for you to have filled out some kind of number in that lines function, or else it's gonna give you the errors. What I suggest people do is you go into lines and you put in placeholder, numbers, you put in your real budget numbers if you want, but it really doesn't matter, but just put in a placeholder number in every column and it, that error will go away. Um, and then upload your actual budget so that we, or cost proposal so that we can see it. Um, so that's how you get rid of that error message. The other error message is this 
a quote value is required for requirement first name. Um, you only have to say that, you know, e-procurement, they have its, it has its own terminology that I just find to be so unintuitive. But regardless, in this, in this particular instance, um, the requirement is e-procurement speak for the application section, the application question section. The quote value, as I mentioned previously, is the answer section. That's the thing that's limited to 4,000 characters, including punctuation and spaces. And the name of the requirement, every requirement in e-procurement, you know, every question kind of has its own name, is first name. And so what basically this, this uh, phrase is saying is that you did not put an answer for the required question, first name, at which point you're going to type in your name, and then all will be well. That, that error will go away. Um, so after you have done all of your resolving of errors, etc. When you hit continue, you'll now be put into this review and submit phase for your application. This is the part where you can do, see where it says printable view over on the right hand side. If you click that printable view, you're going to get a printout, a PDF printout of your entire, of your application as eProcurement interprets it. So it's not going to print out copy of all of your attachments. It will give you a list of the attachments you've attached, but it won't print them out for you. But it will print out all the questions, all the requirements, and all of the quote values that you have put in. Um, from this, you know, you're going to be able to scroll all the way down through your application. Um, and then you're going to see, you can see where your attachments are. You can see all of your answers. This is kind of your last chance to make that last final check. And when you get down to the bottom of the page, it will ask you for your electronic signature. You're going to do that. You're going to fill in the name. You're going to fill in the title. And then you're going to click at the box. If you fill, click the box first, it will give you an error message telling you to do the name and the title. So you're going to do name, title, click the box. And then you're going to look over to the right-hand side of the screen where I did not fit everything in. And once you have done the electronic signature, you're going to be able to click that submit button. When you click submit, you should get a screen that says confirmation. So this is your confirmation screen. And the e-procurement system will send a confirmation email to the email attached or you know, associated with this um, application within 24 hours. Remember, that might end up in your spam or your junk. Um, or if you want more immediate kind of validation on your application being received, please, please, please call me or email me. And I am more than happy to look this up for you. It is not a problem. It is my pleasure. Um, I personally think like this kind of stuff I find to be sort of anxiety producing and maddening. And so it is absolutely 100% my pleasure to verify for you that your application has been in fact received. Um, so that concludes what I have to say about the e-procurement system. Um, and now we can talk more questions. I see that here somebody, when I was chatting uh, about e-procurement, somebody did ask, can you apply for both types of services so that if you are not selected as a dining site, you can still be considered for a catering site? Good question, Ms. Strange. You can. You can apply for both. Um, in that particular instance, I believe we would want you to make a uh, application, two different applications, as opposed to trying to jam a multiple yes. site. Yes, you would have to do two separate applications. Separate applications. When you're making duplicate applications or you're, you're making two applications for different things within the same RFP, you're going to need to have two different accounts make the application. So you'll have one account within your iSupplier account. One account will apply for the dining site and another account will be applied for the catering site. You can have the same email address for both accounts but they have to be they have to be named differently. So you can have Ernie apply for dining and Bert apply for catering, or however you want to set it up. And it can all go to your email, but they do have to have two separate accounts. That's how the 
the procurement system just works as one of their little tricks. So let's see if there are any other questions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and if there are any other questions, and if there's or if, if there are any other comments that that any of my um, co-hosts here would like to make about the RFP process or about this particular RFP, um, um, I know it's supposed to be a hot day out. I'm hoping that everybody there, everybody remembers to stay cool and hydrate. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting some great applicants in to provide this really valuable service for the citizens, this, the older citizens of the city of Chicago, the work that this program does. This is one of my favorite programs, and I'm not just saying that. Um, I think this is like so interesting, and it always is fascinating to me to see over time how the different how the population of the city has sort of shifted in terms of like what we look for in terms of ethnic meals. Um, I've worked for the city for a long time and I don't recall offhand and Nikki, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we, we I think that we, list, we used to do different ethnicities um, in terms of when we were looking for, for um, meals for sub subpopulations of seniors in the city. So that's kind of, you know, that's always fascinating to me. And plus, just the tremendous lift of the people that have been managed this program from my department in terms of having both program specificity and, ex and experience both with the actual food preparation, which is a very highly regulated experience, as well as having a population specificity with knowing how to work and what's really trying to figure out what is best and how what is best for seniors and how to get those services to them. Nikki, I see that you have unmuted yourself. Is there anything you might like to add? Or perhaps she hasn't unmuted herself. Um, so if there are no other uh, questions, that we have. I am going to conclude this webinar. I'm going to thank everybody for coming. If you have additional questions, here's uh, the program question. You can contact Mickey Garbus Proustis, or for non programmatic questions, you can contact me um, and we will get back to you. We will also post your questions in the amendment if they are not super specific to just you and so that everybody can benefit from that knowledge. And other than that, I will, uh, are there any concluding remarks anybody would like to make? The DFSS Senior Nutrition Team just wants to thank you all for coming to this RFP session. And um, we look forward to the applications that come through. So thank you again. Well said. Thank you so much. Um, everybody have a wonderful day and remember to keep hydrated. <laughs>